Hello guys and welcome to another video. I am the Whiskey Speaker or more informally known as Nathan. Thank you so much for joining me today. Now I'm going to be touching on a subject that I've gone on a little bit about in the past but in greater detail today. I'm trying to diversify in the videos that I present to you and hopefully you glean knowledge out of this or even if you have an insight yourself you can come on drop a comment in the box below and get in touch with me and let me know your thoughts on the subject. Now today's video is all about blended whiskey. I myself will hold my hands up and say that I am a single malt snob. However, over time, yes, I know, it can be criminal to some, but in time, bear with me, I have come to appreciate uh, blended whiskey. Okay. Now, I want to actually talk about a little bit mainly of the unsung heroes uh, behind this aspect of an international concept in the industry that often don't get the praise that they deserve and it's a little bit of a dark art maybe to many but touching on that later we will go and basically try and clarify for you what exactly it is that we're talking about now everything the main emphasis today is going to be grain whiskey and uh, malted barley whiskey these are the two now put these two together in Scotland and you get blended scotch whiskey one comes from a nice copper pot still that is the malted barley where it is normally distilled twice in some cases in the lowlands or in other regions but not so predominantly you know three times in the grain concept which is also mainly in the lowlands or traditionally has been known and related to the lowlands because of its light delicate flavor is the continuous steel or patent steel which is a long column in which steam is placed at the bottom rises up through perforated plates as the wash comes down the vapors of the alcohol are stripped from the water and go back up through the perforated plates and are drawn off and the pattern is then repeated until alcohol levels um, can reach up to something like on average 94%. That in turn can then make a neutral grain, emphasis on grain spirit, which traditionally uh, way back when, when it was created by the founding fathers of Robert Stein and later Anise Coffee, um, that spirit was then sent down to London uh, down to the south coast of England uh, to make gins uh, but a little bit of it was kept in Scotland to create uh, grain whiskey however I'm just going to touch a little bit more on going back in history all but be it very briefly when Anise Coffee uh, created the continuous still uh, in the 1830s uh, he actually was told by his Irish uh, counterparts because he was a native proud Irishman and an ex uh, revenue customs uh, person who basically maybe the Irish took exception to him because he was seen as working for the dark side or the enemy of the whiskey industry he was basically in no uncertain terms told to go and do one but unperturbed he then took his invention over uh, to Scotland where they went yes please we love this and from there it then revolutionized uh, the industry fast forward then a little bit in turn which meant that the Irish lost out but they had their concept of a single pot whiskey they had a character a flavor profile that they at all costs would insist that remained true to what they believed was whiskey the continuous still then did its rounds in Scotland, which produced whiskey or grain whiskey at a phenomenal rate, could outstrip production of a pot still, uh, and it could also make it cheaper. However, the offset of that was that the flavour was much more lighter, much more impartial, if you like. Up until the 1850s, single grain whiskey was sold in Scotland and then maybe more down into England um, just as a component on its own uh, because of its light character. 
there was no there was no middle ground. There was grain distilleries producing a light character, and then there was pot stills throughout the rest of the Highlands and all of Isle and all the other regions space side within Scotland that were producing more firmer, robust whiskies. But the two came together in about 1853 when Ushers created old or Ushers old vatted Glenlivet, mingling the light and the more pungent together. This then opened up a new middle ground to which they could then take advantage. And in the 1860s, the grocers, the entrepreneurs such as John Dewars, uh, John Walker, and Arthur Bell of obviously Bell's uh, famous blend, or Matthew Gloag, uh, these guys jumped on the bandwagon and created this new more complex drink that was more appeasing to a wider audience. With it, it meant that the Englishman, the Welshman, could touch into something that was a little bit more um, palatable to their nature. But in turn, that then gave access eventually to the rest of the British Empire, which at uh, its peak then stretched over a third of the globe, or sorry, I should say a quarter of the globe. Uh, and then from there, all the way up until the 1970s, blend was king. And it was only then when you got into the yuppie era of the 1970s onwards that maybe rather arrogantly the industry still thought it could maintain its position uh, and then went into overproduction, creating the whiskey lock of the 1980s. And then blend did take a heavy hit, as did whiskey, single malt, single grain. Every aspect in between took an absolute massive pounding. Now, to moisten my throat whilst I talk, I'm just going to enjoy this Belvini. Oh, it's lovely, 12 year old. Can't go wrong with that. I do hope that wasn't too rude and you don't mind the uh, pleasant um, interruption there. But, so there's a little bit of history, it all came about. Now you've got these big players today. Now, interestingly enough, I'm not going to do the whiskey review. I'm going to talk about going back to them unsung heroes in the background. This is Diageo's uh, green label, which wasn't part of the original concept of uh, when Johnny Walker was then expanded. Uh, obviously, because these main ones were the blacks, the reds and then the later higher end premium blues, they go back in time. This is now a modern concept. But interestingly enough, a lot of um, tours when they tell you about stuff, you know, it's all about keeping a secret, keeping an industry, um, you know, you've got to be in it to know it, and it's all cagey cagey. Rather interestingly enough, with the uh, green label, Johnny Walker, they've actually put on the back of their box the four different uh, whiskey components that actually make it up so they've committed themselves to them whiskies. Now this as an example is a blended malt whiskey. They have gone for Carl Ayla, Craig and Moore, Linkwood and Talisker so all malts. So that's what we would call a malt blended whiskey or you've got a blended scotch which is then the grain coming together with the malt put the two together harmonious happy days that is then the bigger more renowned uh, concept of what is agreed as a malt uh, sorry as a blend or you've got blended uh, grain whiskey which is quite rare where more than one distillery which is of a grain producing nature, bring two different products from their distilleries and harmoniously fat them together and then cask and mature them and allow them to be married to then settle and then be enjoyed by the consumer. Um, so what's the point I'm trying to make after all of this that I'm going on about? Well, what does it take for your drink to be enjoyed? The master blender is the guy or the girl, no discrimination here, in the background, the one, the unsung hero. Now, what do they have responsibility for? They are not just the pretty face that sits on the advertising campaign. And more often than not, 
interesting enough, because blended whiskey is so successful, it now accounts for over 90% or thereof, and no less, 90% of sales in Scotland for whiskey. It almost seems like it can just kind of roll itself on, like a perpetuating motion. Scotch whiskey does control the global market. You know, there are other big boys who are now starting to muscle in on the scene, like the Irish is having a massive resurgence um, and there are now Japanese whiskies that are now starting to take the headlines but the predominant amount of whiskey they sold throughout the world is 90% of blended scotch whiskey so it's kind of interesting that these guys don't get the credit they deserve but it's almost as though you get the sense that because it kind of is in such a key market and is so open and readily available that there's kind of not too much effort put into kind of going into the detail of what makes your favourite blended whiskey what it is. It's more everything. I am guilty of it myself. You know, when I go to a distillery, it's the concept of the purest of a single malt that is driven in marketing terms. Whereas then this, the blend, kind of is allowed to just do its own thing. But you drink something that you come to be assured that day in day out rain or shine will consist of a flavor profile that you love and enjoy the master blender here's his job it is not an easy one he will sit there day in and day out in a nice shiny laboratory or in sometimes a nice showroom he will then get to meet and greet people sometimes and show off how he does his trade he or she will be quite pleased often to actually receive a little bit of attention for something that is remarkably a hard job. Using test tubes, they will then have endless amounts of samples throughout the years, throughout the ages of the distilleries within the company's um, portfolio. He will then sit there and blend what is the base um, of what is expected to be the components of a whiskey or blended scotch. However, he will then nose and taste. If that doesn't come up to the consistency of what is expected to be associated with that blend, he then has to know inside and out, and she again, has to know ins and outs of the profiles of each of them whiskies, so that in turn, if he needs to, or she needs to, can basically compensate by putting in a different whiskey with the same or closest taste profile into that whiskey to basically make sure that the profile consistency remains the same. Can you then do that? Does it basically mean that they, in theory, you might say, have an easy life because they can just use the same whiskies again, put them together and go, there you go, I've done my job, nose, taste, very nice. Well, no. Throughout the years, throughout the centuries, whiskey, because of its... Um, because of its richness and diversity the master blender basically is part of a chain a chain to which he or she has to trust um, the guys in the bonded warehouses he has to trust the master distiller at an individual distillery he has to trust that the grain quality control and every aspect from that distillery if the variant of grain is changed um, because of either a drought, a national shortage, or anything in between. The whiskey that is then produced at that distillery, albeit minor, can just basically be that little bit off, and it means that the consistency of the whiskey that he then has as a sample when he puts it in his jar or in that tube to be then tested as a component might be a little bit off. The peating levels might have not been right. The phenolic levels in the malted barley and uh, less... Uh, and basically the grain variant in a single grain might be different. The casks they then normally use, there might be a national shortage or the price for whatever reason might have skyrocketed because hopefully, touch wood, it doesn't happen, that cooperages uh, might get destroyed for whatever reason and then therefore the type of cask, whether it be a sherry butt or a bourbon barrel, are not necessarily readily available and therefore the flavour and profile of their initial whiskey is a single malt or a single grain, the compounds that make the blend change.
So this is what they're having to do. They're having to consistently gauge the variance of all these whiskies that happen throughout the year, all these different basically potential variants um, that can create differences in their whiskey that they're trying to create one predominant taste, flavour, nose and palate. So it's not easy. They also have a hell of amount of a lot of sway. Um, these guys, if you go into a distillery nowadays, a modern distillery, obviously it's computer controlled and you can get things down to such a finite degree. Some other distilleries will be manually worked, you know, hard graft, labour intense distilleries. Now, for the bean counters and anyone who's like the shareholder who's got to look after the shareholder's needs, they're going to be the first one who wants to rock around the corner, put their stamp on something and say, look, let's not have uh, coal burning for a still. Let's not have gas uh, burning to heat the still. Let's do away with the worm tubs and have a shell tube and condenser. The master blender can turn around and go, if you want me to continue to do my job, you leave things as they are. Because if you touch that, you alter the flavour and I can't do my job. So when something does go wrong, they have to have the in-depth knowledge of knowing that they can rely and fall back on another uh, distillery to produce the component they need. The analogy I'm going to use in this case is a little bit like a pizza. With a pizza, you obviously need a lovely base, whether your preference is thick or thin crust, doesn't matter. For the, all intents and purposes, you need a base. Whatever you put on top, up to you, your call. But it makes a pizza with a base. So they have whiskies that they cannot, for love or money, change. That has to be the overriding major component that goes in. But if they want to change a topping on a pizza, they can. If they want to alter a little bit of a whisky that goes in there, they can, providing they keep the base. So then what they'll do is, when they're creating their whisky, they will then actually put it into a small measuring tube and they might say to them, 100 millilil inside a tube equates to one barrel when it comes to actually vatting or pouring it all into the big uh, vatting uh, holders in order to then let marry and settle. Then another 200 millilitres of another component go into that and they will say that two casks if they like eventually what they've stacked into that tube turns out to be something they like. Now interestingly enough as well we're all human, we're all unique, we're all different, we all like to put our touch and our spin on something. So protégés when they come under the wing of a master blender they watch, they observe but they're not a robot, they are not going to copy the person like for like for reasons that as i've already explained it's almost actually impossible for you to make that job as a blender easy you give no easy street because of the number of variants of water of cask type of barley strain everything you are not given an easy job you yourself want to put your own stamp your own mark on that whiskey and that you will do subtle or big sometimes okay but as the years progress, each blender will put their own stamp, their own twist on it. So you come to drink that whiskey over and over again, you get so accustomed. But there will be a little bit of a variant because they themselves are just going to want to put that little bit of twist, a little bit of spike into it that's going to just basically, to them, mean everything. It's going to bring it to life. So that's basically the job of a blender it is no easy job they are also sometimes responsible for ensuring that not only is the quality controlled through all this different variants that they have to be challenged and dealt with but they also then have to go on and create new blends so that is when like a cooper for instance can take seven years to become qualified these guys can take years you know it 10 years easy you know kind of thing to them 10 15 years to train their nose and their palate to basically be well enough adjusted so that it can recognize even in like a blind tasting what it is that they are actually processing 
Also, when they come to making a blend, they will sometimes water the whiskey down below 40%. And that is basically to not eradicate the alcohol, but to allow the esters, the, you know, the alcohol uh, acids that produce all these wonderful flavours to basically come more presentable to the nose. A couple of reasons. One, because people, as they become more discerning, do like to add water. It's not a right thing or a wrong thing, but like to add water to a whiskey. So they need to know what it's going to taste like with no water in it. They need to taste it, what it's like at full cask strength. Um, you know, they need to get all these variants to actually understand what it is at the end of the day they are presenting to the consumer. So there is a lot going on there. So, so guys, I really do hope that you know this gives you a little bit of an insight. They are, in many respects, as I say, they kind of they're overlooked, but they're such an important, valuable asset to any company. Because to take an extreme, master blenders can't all catch the same plane together. They can't all get in the same car together. It might sound like an old thing, but it's stuff like that. That one in a million, heaven forbid, you know, touch wood again. That if they were killed, for instance, all that knowledge goes with them. If all the master blenders and the juniors were all in that one car or in that one plane, that means that there would be nobody who has a grasp or an understanding of years and years of self-education that's been built up in order to create that blend. Something that, as a consumer we can easily take for granted um, so I just wanted to basically just bring this all to your attention I hope you've learned something and I hope I've been clear and able to demonstrate that it isn't an easy job it is something that kind of goes on in the background without much attention and I think it deserves a little bit more praise so next time when you go and raise your glass and you know cheers somebody or you just want to mind your own business sit down and relax with that blend you just come to appreciate actually all the detail that has gone into what makes your favorite whiskey what it is thank you very much guys for joining me today that's the end of my little uh, blended whiskey lecture i do hope you've enjoyed it as ever if you've got any comments or any suggestions please do drop them in the box below and you know i would love to hear from you as ever I'm going to keep on saying it next week. If I get the chance and time, I will, of course, drop another video for you guys. And, you know, in the meantime, keep safe. Keep that uh, whiskey cabinet being explored. Keep on getting on the internet, ordering bottles from either a distillery to keep them in business so they don't go under, or keep that shop ordering from there so that they don't go under, so that we can all continue to enjoy whiskey, which is such an amazing drink. Thank you very much for your time, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Keep safe. Speak to you soon.